Well, good evening and welcome everyone. Bienvenue à tous. My name is Courtney Meller and I'm a librarian at the Ottawa Public Library. And I'm so happy to be with you here tonight for this Mindfulness for Parents webinar. Mental Health Week takes on a particular significance this year. There is not one of us who is not themselves or does not know someone going through mental health challenges. It is important to acknowledge that we are gathering this evening on the traditional and ceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. Now, during the program, if you have a question in either English or French, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. This is found at the bottom of the screen. In Facebook, please add your questions on the comment field. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Rebecca Wallace Roy and Sherston Wallace, our special guests this evening. Rebecca of Be Kind, Be Brave, Be Present is a registered social worker and a psychotherapist who is passionate and mind about mindfulness and mindful parenting. Rebecca is based in Ottawa. She's a mama of two and provides a creative mindful counseling practice for children, families, and individuals. Tristan Wallace is an ECE and runs Swell Mama Yoga in, in Calgary. She's a doula and birth educator and a mama four, and she brings mindfulness and movement into everything she does. Rebecca and Kristen are following up tonight's webinar for parents with two workshops. Um, the children's workshop on May 10th is already full, but you can still add your name to the wait list. And of course, there's still some space for the teens on May 17th at 4.30 p.m. These workshops have limited registration, so we encourage you to sign up on the Ottawa Public Library website. I also want to encourage everyone to visit the mindfulness blog on the, on the library website, which includes reading lists with many of Rebecca and, and Tristan's recommended resources. So without further ado, over to you, Rebecca and Tristan. All right, everyone, we're going to just begin by centering and finding some grounding. And so if you could find a comfortable sitting position, maybe you're sitting on your floor, maybe you're in your chair or on your sofa, but wherever you are, let's close our eyes or lower our gaze and see if we can just turn our attention inward, just lengthening the spine, extending the crown of the head up towards the ceiling. Joan Halifax talks about strong back and soft front. So keeping that openness, receptivity on our front body and the strength and solidity of our spine. Brene Brown adds wild heart, but we're not gonna go there today. And just taking a moment to scan your body. Just notice if you're feeling tension or tightness. As you start perhaps at the top and work your way down, just checking in with the spaces where you know you like to stash away fear or tension, stress, pain. And bringing a little softness into those spaces with the breath. And in this space of connection of body and breath, let's invite the mind, setting our intentions, our intention for your workshop this evening. Maybe in a word or a thought, you can describe what you hope to take away from our session tonight. And then when you're ready, you can slowly lift your gaze, open your eyes. And I'll take us through uh, très vite en français. Je sais que que cette, cette formation ce soir va, va se faire en anglais, mais je voulais dire bonjour à tous les, tous les francophones qui sont présents avec nous. Vous avez accès à tous les documents en français et vous pouvez absolument mettre tous vos commentaires, toutes vos questions dans le chat ou dans les, les questions-réponses qui sont en bas de l'écran. I would love to answer any questions in English or French. Rebecca and I, I'll, I'll field the French ones as we go through. And so tonight, what we're going to cover are introductions, although Courtney did quite a stellar job earlier. We'll talk about the impact of stress because it is, uh, it's a bit of a catchphrase keyword right now, what, what we're living with and going through. Now we'll discuss what is mindfulness and how we can incorporate mindful parenting into our lives. 
we'll discover some strategies that we can practice. We'll actually do a practice, an exercise in mindfulness and in our dose. And we'll close, um, send you away with some homework and try to answer as many of the questions as we can. So again, so, um, yeah, go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> well, I just wanna make sure, I see that Jane and Tim commented that the volume is too low. So I just wanna check in to make sure everyone can hear us really well before we go into our introductions and everything else. So if Shurston, you wanna pop your volume up, then if anyone wants to let us know that their volume's not okay, drop that into the chat, please. All right, Shurston, sorry to interrupt, carry on. I will have to project my voice because I'm at the maximum. <laughs> and of course my really fabulous AirPods decided not to connect to my computer for whatever reason tonight. So, hey, I'm just gonna surf that way as I move on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, do, do we want to add anything to the introductions? I think. Um, Absolutely. Well, I'd like to know what, how many kids everyone has, because everyone is a parent. So we'd love to know how many children and what are the ages of your children, because that'll give us a little bit of an idea of where we want to cater our workshop today. So if you have children who are all, you know, under five, that's going to be a little bit of a different story for us. So we want to see what the age range is of your kids. So drop that into the chat and that would be wonderful. There we go. Is it Valerie, I think has four children, just like Shurston. I do. I, my kids are eight, eight, 11, 16 and 18. So I've got quite the amazing spread and uh, yeah. All right. This is so neat to see all the numbers. So I have an 11 and a nine year old. And so there we go, me and Andrea, we share our 11 and nine year old theme here. So let's go. Thank you for dropping us in. So Sherston, essentially we have the entire gamut. Yeah. The range is from yeah. the very beginning to the very end. No problem. We can totally make this work because that's what we do. <laughs> and this is it. And so what we are, in order to give us an idea, I mean, we have a pretty good idea already, but we would be very interested to know what are some of the stresses that you are facing as parents of small people, medium-sized people, larger people um, as parents <laughs> and partners. Um, obviously we're in a pandemic right now. So that there's, there's so many stresses. I'm I'm in Alberta, I'm in Calgary. And, uh, and Alberta, as you may know, has the highest per capita rates of COVID. And we've all, we close the schools tomorrow. So tomorrow there's gonna be a huge shift in the lives of, of many parents. Um, and on Monday, Rebecca spoke on CBC with Ellen Neal about the experiences of apathy for our kids for online schooling. So that that's, probably something that will be coming up. If you want to start dropping into the chat, some of the stresses that you guys are facing or some of the challenges that you're facing as parents. Um, so many of us oh, are experiencing, yeah, experiencing what Adam Grant write, wrote about in the New York Times, I believe it was last week on languishing. And it's this dulling of, the, of delight or the dwindling of drive, as he writes, the indifference to indifference, this feeling of being wilted and just really lacking motivation. And so our kids are no different. As adults, our kids are no different from what, from what we are experiencing. So when we see apathy or languishing setting in, it's an amazing, important cue for, that tells us that something isn't right and that we need to lean in. It's time for us to lean in with some mindful parenting tools, as Rebecca said, that will help us to figure out, and I quote, what would have to be true to help them surf the waves of COVID, isolation, online school, and all the blah, the Simpson meh, that comes along, comes along with it. So Rebecca's gonna take us through right now, um, the effects of stress and, and what, what it does to us. So this one's a really, really important part of this workshop. Because I think that some of us, we want to talk about the problems and then we want to go directly into the solutions. But if we don't actually understand what's happening in the body and why we may be feeling that languishing, 
why we may be feeling that wilting, anger, frustration, apathy, just a complete sense of, Ugh, then we, we don't have a lot that we can work on in the immediate because the body is so powerful for telling us how to handle things right now. So when I work with my clients, I often ask them, where in your body do you feel this? In fact, my clients make fun of me all the time about it because they say, oh, Rebecca, because it's like, where do you feel it? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, let's tune in. And the reason is because 80% of our experiences in the world are felt in the body. And so this is that subconscious part. It's, it's that when you walk into a room and you go, oh, this doesn't feel safe, that's felt in the body. 20% is actually felt in the brain. So subconsciously 80, consciously is 20%. And that means, if you think about it, all that work that's happening in the 80% is all the breath. We breathe 22,000 times a day. Our heart rate goes up. I don't know about you, but at the beginning of this workshop, my heart rate was pounding, just a little nerves, a little nerves. And then as I took my deep breath and I exhaled, I felt my heart rate start to drop, right? But that was a conscious effort. I made a decision and said, oh, I should do this. I need to calm myself down. But the truth is, oh, I've got a fully formed brain. I'm over 25 years old. I'm a lot older than 25 years old, in fact. And we expect our kids to know, to do better, to like know what they've done wrong. When in truth, their bodies and even our bodies, it's the, their nervous systems that are leading the show. It's their part of their bodies that are trying to keep them safe, that are trying to soothe. So stress is a little bit like dominoes, right? An experience can set off this chain of, of, of reactions that when, begin when the body feels unsafe, which then talks to the brain, which then sends a message back down and says, wait, we should react. Or if we're really lucky, we can maybe respond. And so stress can be highly motivating. We can write exams, we can do reports, we can uh, cross the road safely, right? The immediacy of stress is beautiful. However, chronically, stress is like that huge obstacle that sits in that way of getting toward the reward center, that, that thing that keeps us motivated. It also gets in the way of our executive functioning. And this is so important for us to understand because while we might know better, when we're feeling unsafe, our body shifts into biological survivor mode. It goes into what feels good now. So that might mean for me, I'm not gonna lie, if there's a bowl of chocolate chips, I might just eat the bowl of chocolate chips. Or if I'm feeling really upset, I might just go and I might yell. Or if I'm feeling super exhausted and tired, I just shut down because that's what my body is saying it needs. The thing is the same thing with our kids. When our kids are feeling overwhelmed, they might start spinning like tops. They might start verbalizing and mouthing off. They might start getting disrespectful. They might start throwing things. They might start shutting down. They might start looking at screens constantly. They might start playing video games for eight to 10 hours a day. What that is, is their bodies are trying to make sense of the sensations and their actions are just acting out what's going on inside. So the cool part is, when I start seeing those big emotions, when I start seeing the apathy, when I start seeing these behaviors, that is my cue. That is my cue that something is not okay and that it's time for me to lean in. It's time for me to start connecting. And it's time for me to start exploring what it would be like to be a mindful parent, right? So let's talk a little bit more. I, I use this example of the shaken body. And I love this metaphor because it really speaks to my little people. I do it with actually, my little people include ages three to 98 because I do teach meditation to the seniors across the street. And I actually use this example. So I think it crosses all demographics, but this is what our body. So imagine this is your body and your body's constantly seeking cues of danger and safety. And it goes into reaction mode. So let's say um, I wake up and my kid wakes me up early before I'm ready to wake up. It's like a little shake of my body. And then I turn on the CBC and it talks about how COVID has totally taken over Calgary and I'm now all worried about my family. Shake of the body, right? And then I go outside and I have a beautiful eight and a half pound marquee who's lovely, but if we don't take care of her in the morning, there might be a little gift for me at the front door. 
shake of the body. So what happens when I have a whole lot of shakes? Can you guys guess what happens? I just put the slide up so I gave you a big hint, but this is it, it explodes, right? So what we wanna talk about is how do we do some little slow releases through the day so that we don't get to the space of explosion. This metaphor seems to cross a lot of different people and it makes sense to them. So I invite you to check that one out. Shurston. So how can being mindful, how can being a mindful parent help us when we're experiencing all of these stresses? Well, mindfulness is choosing to be aware of the present moment with kindness, openness, curiosity. And I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna share an example of, you know, two situations, same, a same situation of reaction of Shurston as a non-mindful parent or in a non-mindful space and, and then practicing my mindfulness. So I pick up my kids at 3.45 at the bus stop and it's a two minute walk. It's just a bit of background information. It takes me two minutes to get there. So me, version one, non-mindful, I am sitting working at my computer. And at 3.43, I look at my screen and crap, I have to be at the bus stop. I'm not ready, I'm still in my slippers. So there's first shake of my bottle because I'm gonna be late. And so then I race to my entryway and I trip over my daughter's skateboard that she was supposed to put away and did not put away. And there's another couple of shakes because I hurt myself. And so then I put my shoes on and I run out the door because now I'm really late. And I've got my phone. And as I'm racing down the street, I hit, get a ping and it's the government of Alberta saying to me that they've stopped all kids sports and activities for at least the next two weeks. And I've got my kids in, they do judo and they do circus school and, and, and they're in art class. And now they're doing nothing. And they've like the schools are closed and I turn the corner and my kids get off the bus and they're racing towards me with their arms out. And I am just frazzled I'm frazzled and I'm frustrated. And my Iris who's my youngest runs up and she's crying because Hugo didn't, she's upset because Hugo didn't let her up in the seat. And what's my reaction? Well, I will rip into Hugo because Hugo, we've talked about this. How many times have we talked about letting your sister, you got to work on your schedule and we're working, walking home and I'm just not paying attention and I'm angry. And what, how do you think my kids feel? Put it in the chat. How do you think my kids are feeling right now? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Hurt, exactly. They're feeling hurt, disconnected. Yeah, they're not feeling so great. I, and I'm not feeling so great. So version two. Version two is I pick my kids up at 345. So I have a little timer that things at 340. And so because I've got this, I can make that choice to, okay, 3.40, it's time for my kids. So I close my computer and I go to my front entryway and yeah, I still trip on the skateboard, but this time I go, hey, sweet reflexes. I totally didn't fall, killed it mama. I put my boots on and I open up the door and I saw four minutes. And so I can make this again, choice to just enjoy these moments and take in my surroundings. I walk down my steps. I can smell spring and the sounds of the birds. And I see my neighbor across the street who's moving in and I can wave and say, hey, welcome to the hood. I can't come anywhere near you. You probably can't even understand me because I'm wearing my mask, but that's okay. And then I'm walking down the street and I can feel that I take time. I love this. I take time to walk on the grass and then on the sidewalk and just kind of celebrate the feeling of the texture under my feet and the difference come around the corner and my kids are running towards me with their arms wide open and I open up my arms and they run into my arms and I hug them and I hold them and Iris says Hugo didn't let me sit by the window and I say man that's a bummer let's walk home and talk about maybe you guys making up some solutions about how we can and we can fix this or help this or solve this or not even solve it, brainstorm. What is it we can do to make it better? How do you think my kids are feeling? And what do you think I'm feeling, right? Like this is the difference is that I am in a space to be able to surf the waves as they come. 
I uh, forgot to mention that I didn't have notifications on my phone in the second mindful one. So I didn't even get that message yet. Doesn't even matter. I'll look at it later because what difference is it going to make? It's canceled. There's nothing else I can do. <laughs> so, so right. Like it's just a totally different way of, of approaching the things that happen in our, in our world. So that there are some different ways that we can practice our mindful moments. We can practice them through breathing, through breath work. We can do mindful movement. We can do mindful moments, just general kind of everyday tasks that we do and make them mindful. And we can do mindful eating. Those are four just really simple strategies or, or opportunities more so, opportunities for us to practice our mindfulness or to develop our mindful muscles. Um, it's nothing magical. You don't need props. You don't need the fancy pants. You don't need huge slots of time. It's actually better to do them in small, to chunk it, to break it down and have these mindful moments throughout the day that just bring us back. Beck calls the, sorry, Rebecca, she's my sister, she's my little sister. So Beck sometimes, like that. <laughs> Rebecca calls these glimmers, which I quite love. She calls them the glimmers and the more we glimmer, the more we glow. Um, so if we just take a look at the breath meditation, you don't need to have a fancy mindful or meditation cushion. Um, Rebecca's trick is that when she goes through a door frame, she pauses and just takes a couple breaths, with her hands on the frame. And that is her mindfulness practice. And people find it really hard to sit in stillness and work on and focus on their breath. I'd be curious to know how you guys felt at the start. It was two minutes, but how did that land with you to just tune in and check or tune into your breath and the sensations in your body? So maybe it's just standing. You know, and there are lots of different techniques and ways that we can practice our breathing or just breathe. We do it 22,000 times a day. Mindful moment or movement, pardon me. For me, the door frame is my mindful movement. Um, I'm a huge advocate fan of Katie Bowman. And she recommends every time you go through the door frame, lift your arms. Because we don't lift our arms over top of our heads nearly enough. We don't get that movement for our shoulders. So for me, that's one of my mindful movements is raising my arms up over my head to feel that door frame or to give a quick stretch to my pecs. We live all, all of us live in this internal rotation where we turn inwards. But your mindful movement can be as simple as sitting at your desk and just having a time to stretch your neck, to stretch your hands while you're waiting for your tea kettle to boil, to stretch your calves when you're going up the stairs. There's all sorts of opportunities for mindful movement. Mindful moments, showering, in your shower, it's taking a second to be to turn the water to cold. Woo! That'll bring you right back, right back, right into that present moment and then make it warm. It's funny because I've been trying that. This is Beck's, Rebecca's trick. Both Iris and I, we really, because my youngest showers, we don't like that. We don't like it at all. That's, we've turned it to really warm and then we kind of play with it. But, but, but that is an opportunity, washing your dishes, brushing your teeth. It could be uh, ironing if anybody irons anymore, folding your laundry. Those moments where usually you zone out and think about all the other stuff that you have to do or instead to turn in and actually experience the sensations of what it is that you're doing. Mindful eating, drinking your tea could be just taking a moment to close your eyes, to smell, to feel, to touch, to taste what it is that you're eating. It could be a meal, it could be a particular food. It could be while you're making your meal, just being really present, not having any distractions and just tuning into the sounds and the smells and the tastes, the textures as you're preparing your meal. Um, the goal is to create rituals around presence and to take it from that routine, that mindless routine into that mindful ritual and again as we said earlier just being able to have these short bursts throughout the day practicing compassionate meditation regularly helps us to be better people it helps us to develop our prefrontal cortex we can continue to develop our brains as as we uh, as we age by through the practice of meditation but it doesn't have to be something that is huge and daunting like the 45 minutes a day sitting on your cushion. Um, you know, begin with something small, something accessible, something easy. And then what happens is as we develop this capacity, our thoughts are just simply thoughts. 
rather than taking things that take us away into these panic, fearful spaces. They just pass like thoughts as we, uh, cars that pass on a highway or clouds in the big blue sky floating by. And we understand, you know, how to, how to release and not attach our ego to these, to these thoughts and, and to tune into the sense of peace and calm. Uh, yeah, oxygen mask on first. So how, how do we do this? How do we integrate these moments truly into our lives? How do we really learn how to do all of this stuff? Because it's really easy to say. And Rebecca and I have been practicing these things for, for many, many years. Um, but it's doable because we're breaking it down. I think I mentioned earlier, chunking it. And the more we practice, the neurons that wire together are fire together, wire together. It's Hebb's law. And so the more we do it, the more we want to do it, the more we're seeking out and creating time to do these things. And so to start starting with creating habits. And so perhaps some of you have read um, James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, lately. It's one of the bestsellers that, that people are reading. And it really has a lot of great information about how to create these habits that can transform our lives. And truly these mindful moments, these mindful minutes are a fantastic place to start. In order to develop a new habit, James Clear says that we need to make it obvious, attractive, easy, and satisfying. Obvious, attractive, easy, satisfying by pairing an action that we want to do. So practicing stillness in these moments of mindfulness with an action we need to do. We need to breathe, we need to move, we need to get stuff done and we need to eat, we need to shower, and we need to eat. We're going to be far more success, likely to be successful at establishing it, creating these habits. You need to plan ahead though. It's not just gonna happen if you think about it every once in a while. So it's something that you gotta think about, something that you gotta plan for. And it's something that you need to set intention for. And that again, is that difference between routine, mindless routine and ritual. And ritual has this notion, this idea of intention that happens in behind it. When I am mindfully brushing my teeth, I'm only brushing my teeth. This morning I was listening on the radio, I was talking about this, how women are better at multitasking. No, we're really not better at multitasking. Multitasking is a farce <laughs> because you're unable to be truly present when we're multitasking. And we've tried to create this as something that, that is a superhero quality when really, Let's flip it, let's flip it. Rebecca is gonna tell us a little bit about how we can find this balance and make sure that we can put our oxygen masks on first before we try to, to help our children. So I love what Sherston just talked about, about the multitasking piece, because we're trying to celebrate multitasking. I wish you could meet our mother. Our mother is the queen of multitasking. We have the radio on, she's watching TV, she's teaching a class, she's knitting a sweater, and then she's also cooking dinner while also playing the piano. She has 15 arms. We learned as children how to be really incredible multitaskers. But it's kind of like having a lot of windows open in your computer. Not everything's working at full efficiency. And a lot of us as parents, we have to multitask because we have to survive. Mindfulness isn't an invitation for us to only look at one thing all the time. There are moments for autopilot. We love the autopilot for certain things, but it's about setting that intention and, and getting a little balance, setting the intention to find those moments that become so crucial for getting a sense of peace. So I love that. I love also James Clear's book, that obvious subtractive easy and satisfying, so really putting it into play. So let's talk about how we do this with our balance wheel. This is a tool that was taught to me in 2008 by, it was gifted to me by grandmother Irene. And I really loved it. And it was based on the medicine wheel and I have used it um, for this entire experience. So from all of my counseling met and all of my work that I have done. So it works on the basis of four things our physical, emotional, mental, and then our connection to something greater than ourselves. This is a really, really big piece because we want that sense of balance. So here we go. Let's talk a little bit about how we can practice these four parts. 
So I did a little example this morning and I have clients who do this because every one of my clients gets to go through this practice of the, the using their balance wheel. And so some of my clients do it in collage. Some of them do it in paintings. I've had it in like spreadsheet form. What's most important is that we use it. So here's some of the things that help for me. So physically, I really value going outside. I like being indoors. I like going for walks. I like playing sports. We are really quite isolated right now. We're really spending time only as a family. So I bought one of those badminton nets and we play badminton almost every night. In fact, that's what my family's doing right now as I teach this workshop. Um, I like to sleep. Sleep is really important to me. Emotionally, I talk to Sherston probably one to 17 times a day. I think today actually was probably about five hours. Um, I like to meditate. I like to create. I like to do things that emotionally filled my heart place. This is that part that, that connects that heart space. Mentally, we need space to do things that are unproductive, that are not related to work, but that float our boat and make us passionate. We can find balance between those things. So while I love teaching, and I love working and learning about mindfulness and polyvagal theory and trauma and working with my clients and doing this stuff. I also create space to be mentally stimulated by cooking, listening to podcasts, creating art, uh, reading what I call brain candy. So things that just are easy fluff material that are just easy for me to read. And then that connection to something greater than yourself. This is that part that we realized in, in clinical work that it's important that we not only just focus on inward, but we also focus outward. And so that connection to self can be um, beyond ourselves, can be volunteerism, it can be going to church, it can be practicing spirituality, it can be meditation, it can be showing gratitude, it can be taking care of our animals, it can be taking care of our children in ways that are, make us feel as though our bowl is being filled. So all of these things are important. And I'm wondering if you could take a moment to just write down in the chat, what are some of the things that you do to fill your balance wheel. Can everyone think of one thing and just let us know? And I just realized that I've been writing all these messages only to the panelists. So if I will have to figure that out. I've been talking to Rosie and I've been talking to <laughs> everyone, I'm sending little chat comments. <laughs> and please remember that you can go to the Q and A so that you can write your answers there and we can see them there as well. There we go. Jocelyn is gardening. I love it. Crocheting and doing string art, running, reading, walking, sitting outside, drawing, yoga, going on bike rides. This, this is what helps us to not languish. This, those moments, right? And when we see ourselves, who just wrote this one? Carla Ann. When we see ourselves succumbing to that scrolling on the phone, that's okay. That's your nervous system trying to take care of itself. That is absolutely fine. However, when we're ready, we might want to just do a little pick me up and we go out and we do something from our, our, our balance wheel. So let me see, did we miss anything else? Justin, sitting in the sun, cooking, essential oils, creativity. Oh, Ginny, the power of essential oils and creativity, balancing those five senses, things we can smell, touch, taste, feel, hear right? All of those things fill our balance wheel in powerful, powerful ways. So let's talk a little bit about what mindful parenting looks like. We've put on our oxygen mask, right? Hold on, I just want to come back to Robin's question. What happens when we legitimately can't find time? So this is when it comes to the prioritizing. This is when it gets really hard and really real, Robin. And this is when sometimes it helps to work with our professionals in the crowd to kind of sit down and look at our schedules and see if we can find those small glimmers. Those small glimmers, it doesn't have to be big. Brushing your teeth, we brush our teeth all the time. If we shift it from brushing our teeth to mindfully brushing our teeth with intention, it becomes a glimmer and it gets to get launched into our spirit bowl. If it has every day, I start by drinking a really beautiful, I'm really, obsessed with Bengal spice tea. I don't know if you've discovered it, but it is my favorite thing. And I drink cups and cups of Bengal spice tea because the smell just makes me sing. And so right there, if I put that into my, my balance wheel, that's one of my pieces, that's a glimmer. So it doesn't have to be big. 
we don't have to invest huge. We just want to invest with intention. So Robin, that was a beautiful question. So here's that what we're talking about. Start with enjoying the first, yes. Beautiful, Madam Yoga. That's amazing. Here we go. So let's talk about what mindful parenting is really all about. Okay, so these are the essential components that Shirsten and I believe are, are part of what being a mindful parent is all about. We didn't come up with these ourselves. These are all tools that we've come up with clinicians such as Dr. Ross Green, Dr. Laura Markham, Carla Nomberg, Susan Stifelman, Kristen Race, Dan Siegel, Tina Payne, uh, Hunter Clark Fields, and one of my favorites was the Calm the Chaos program, Dana Abraham. I've read all the books, Justin has read the books. We've taken all the courses and the cool part is, is we've just kind of compiled it all for you today. So you don't have to read them all. Um, and again, all of these book lists are in that excellent book list that Courtney mentioned at the beginning of the session that you, I invite you to all check out. So if you do wanna read some, let me know. I have some really good ones that might be specific to what you need. So here is some of the stuff we believe. The first one is that behavior is communication. Every single thing that we see our children do is helping them to soothe the nervous system. So that is the tip of the iceberg. What we see below is what's happening in their body and we wanna pay attention to that. The second one is that kids do well when they can. This is Ross Green's fundamental piece. Our kids do well when they can. We got to create expectations that fulfill everyone's needs in that family system. So we want to create the expectation that it fits the developmental need. We want to create the expectation that fits the environmental need. Right now, Maslow's period, pyramid's getting a lot of slack because of a lot of really good reasons. But what I like about it, it's, it's a bit like a Jenga block, right? You've got your physical, you've got that safety, then you've got your belonging, your intimacy and self-actualization. Well, very few of us are feeling safe right now. Very few of us are feeling when we walk out of the house and we see people without masks, there's that moment of, oh! and if you've watched that extra gum commercial that's been going around and everyone's all excited about leaving their homes. I don't know if you watched it, but I cried because it was like this moment of safety. Has anyone else seen that commercial? Did anyone else see it? I'm curious because I don't even think I talked. Yes, yeah, see, Rosie saw it. Rosie gets me. It was like one of those things. It was just like so emotional, right? Because we don't feel the safe and the connection that that part of us that is with us. No, I will come back to you in two seconds. Oh, there you go. You got it. <laughs> so I think it's really, really important that we talk about creating expectations that fit the needs and of our children's emotional, physical, mental, and then that connected part of self. Timothy, absolutely. It's the extra, I think it's, I don't want to advertise for extra gum, but it was really good commercial. It's really, I think it was, it was it extra or Excel. It was, it was green. It was spearmint. That's what I remember. Here we go. The next one is that kids are not giving you a hard time. They are having a hard time. If you can walk away with one thing from this workshop, and it be that it's not personal, then we have done a decent job. Because the things that your kids are going through, it's because they need to go through this to learn it. It's their nervous system that's acting this up. It's their developmental stage. It's the pressures, it's the stresses, it's all this, it's not personal. Our kids are behaving this way because they have developing an immature nervous system. And their biological imperative is to protect, to soothe and to feel better. It's not about you. That one is the hardest thing. And I'm not going to lie. Just before this workshop, I totally lost it. I was feeling super stressed because I came upstairs and the house was a mess. And I, I, I didn't follow my own advice. I forgot that it's not about me. My kids didn't clean the kitchen, not because they, they wanted to hurt me. They did it because they were busy doing something else. They were filling them what they, they're, they're doing the slow release of their bottle, right? So that's a big one for us to remember. And then this ties in, right? That it is their job to make mistakes. We learn really well when we make mistakes. If we have really strong and healthy, confident consequences that make sense. It doesn't mean we don't have ownership. Mindful parenting is not about not having consequences. Mindful parenting is about boundaries. It's like we create the frame, they create the art. You know, so their job is to make mistakes and that is okay. Cause you know what? 
we make mistakes. That is part of being a human. We, we screw up all the time and that is okay. The problem is, is that in our world, we've shamed people who've made mistakes. We, we judge, we shame, we, we say, what are you doing? Well, when that happens, that just pushes us down into that nervous system feeling unsafe. We don't learn, remember? We go offline, that thinking brain goes offline. So creating an environment that says, it's okay to make mistakes, but we're gonna own it. We're gonna take responsibility. And then you know what? I'm gonna coach you through it because that's the next piece is our job is to coach. So if we see our kids acting out, it's because their survival modes are kicking in and that's our cue to step back, manage our own emotions, release the energy in our own bottles, then lean in and coach our kids around those emotions. And the truth is, this is one of the most important pieces that I think both Sherston and I have truly mastered is that rupture is inevitable. I'm really good at rupturing, but wow, I am amazing at repairing. Repairing is essential and our kids are gonna give us so many incredible opportunities to practice this. And my job as a parent is to create competent, compassionate, capable, creative, collaborative, connected human beings and teaching them that I make mistakes is one of the best ways for me to get there. Competent, compassionate, capable, creative, collaborative, and connected human beings. Please note that I did not say convinced, right? We're not there to convince our kids to do things. I didn't say controlled, right? That is not part of that process of being a mindful parent. And that is a really important part. Okay, that was big, that was heavy. So Bird, Sherston. Her nickname is Birdie. So there we go. So Sherston is going to walk us through a mindful moment. I am. Here we go. This is a mindful moment. This one's a bit fun because we've just, we've just had some rupture and, uh, and we're feeling a little worked up. So I'd like you to take your fists, right? Squeeze them. Squeeze them as tight as you possibly can. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. And release. And then we're going to stand up so you can see this. We're going to take our hands out to the side and we're going to flick. Just flick your hands and flick them. Turn your palms to face up. Take them up over your head. Take them back down. Turn your palms to face down. Take them up over your head. Woo! Take them back down. Mine are hurting. Shake it out. <laughs> shake, shake, shake. Oh, okay, bring the backs of your hands together. Just walk side to side. Notice if your shoulders really want to come along for the right. Don't invite your shoulders. Just leave them, leave them down. And so this one, you may have find that your hands are up high. We're trying to get our thumbs together. And you can just bring them down. This is all just things that we can do to help counter that in, internal rotation, that turning inwards of our shoulders and our hands because we're always on keyboards. So important. One last little quick one that we'll do is we'll bring the arm to the side, palm faces up, and draw the fingers straight back. Draw them back. Notice your hand might want to come to the center, might want to lift up. See if you can keep a nice right angle and just bring them. If you've got more time, you can explore each finger on its own. Try not to let the finger buckle, but just keeping them straight back. And again, they're going to want to migrate towards the center line. And with your thumb, you just hook, so it's kind of make a fist. You're taking the, the hand down and the thumb, you pull at the base like a joystick. I'm going to do the other side in French. D'accord? Donc là, ce qu'on va faire, c'est qu'on va faire un angle droit avec l'autre bras, avec la paume vers la haut, et on prend les, les doigts et on les tire, on les descend, on baisse les doigts vers le sol. Essayons de ne pas les plier. On va les garder tout le long. Et là encore, hein, ça peut être très difficile. Donc, on voit. Et si, si c'est difficile, là, c'est là où on devient curieux. C'est là où on est, on est doux. On est ouvert. Bienveillant. On peut faire chaque doigt à la fois. Attention, on ne veut pas que la main migre vers le centre. Et puis, on va faire la même chose hein, avec le pouce. Là, on baisse. Donc, l'énergie, la main descend, mais on prend le pouce et on recule. Et c'est un peu comme le, bon, je ne sais pas comment dire ça en français, le joystick, Atari joystick, or maybe Nintendo. I don't have those. 
I don't know. But like, do you imagine you your video? I believe that there's probably some things like that. Ah, shake it out. So those are some really nice ideas for moving our hands, which we neglect completely. Oh, Rebecca, you're muted. Unmute Check that out. There we go. I'm back on. It's okay, everyone. Here we go. It's because my dog decided, my kids decided to let my dog in. And so my dog was running in circles. So <laughs> the life of working and teaching from home, right? We are, we are working through pandemic in action, my friends. So let's talk about how do we become mindful parents. This is kind of how we get there, right? So we start with that oxygen mask. We understand what's happening in our body. We take care of ourselves by practicing our balance. We give space to make mistakes. We give space to have that, 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 uh, that agreement or that understanding that, you know what, punishment does not help us to move, but coaching does help us to move towards the kind of parent that we want to be and the kind of child that we want to help create. And then we like to look at some other things like connection, yes tone, really diving into understanding and what Shirsten and I have beautifully called is the dose. We thought we'd keep with that whole, um, that pandemic parenting piece by calling it a dose of parenting, right? So here's what it looks like. We always go back to connection. We are social beings, which means that we self-regulate through co-regulation. That means I yawn, you yawn. You know, and I do this with my clients and, and I have clients in Toronto. I've got clients all over Ontario and I'll sit there, oh, yawn. And then I watch them yawn and I say, do you see how this works? My body's talking to your body. My mirror neurons are speaking to your mirror neurons and, and neurons are that part of our brain that fire information. And so our children learn through modeling. So what I see sometimes when I talk to parents and they come to me and they say, oh, Rebecca, I'm so angry. My kid yells all the time. And I say, how do you respond? And they're like, well, I yell back. And I say, okay, how's that working out for you? Right? So we want to be able to understand that our kids model because that's how we are as social beings. In other words, we learn and we feel and we feel, experience the world better when we have another person to coach us when we're surrounded by other people. And, and truthfully, we're not meant to parent in isolation. We're not meant to teach in isolation and we're sure as heck not meant to grow up in isolation. So this is hard right now. Somehow that silly gum commercial gives me hope that it's a temporary experience, right? This is hard, but we need to balance that that need for the following the rules of isolation with also engaging, finding that co-regulation. And so I know that my, a lot of my families, my parents are feeling overtouched. My children are feeling undertouched. My parents are feeling like there's not enough time for connection. My children are feeling like there isn't enough connection. It's about finding our balance. It's about modeling. And I know what I'm asking you, it's, it's hard. <laughs> but we can get there with those small glimmers. And for the, I, I'd love to take the credit for the glimmers, but that's Deb Dana's work. Just for the record, I just wanna give props to the people who deserve the props on that one. So you might notice also that when we convince a child it's not very futile, put on mittens on a toddler, tell your kid, get off the phone, right? Don't you understand how bad it is for your brain development for you to be sitting on a phone for 12 hours a day, but it doesn't work. However, if I'm connected to my kids, if I've been sitting there and I'm engaging, they're more likely to be open. They're more likely to be open to suggestions, my coaching, as well as my connection. And thankfully for all of us, parenting just gives us all that time and a million opportunities, right? To relearn this lesson over and over again. So when in doubt, shift the game back to connection and collaboration. They work. I assure you, they really do work. They take a little longer but they certainly move me closer to being the parent that I want to be. So how do we do it? We find daily connection to ourselves, to our family and to our, our kids. And it is not a weekend warrior kind of experience. 
This is everyday intentional practice. It's about creating ritual and routines, maybe eating supper with our families once a day. There's some really great research about the importance of having one meal a day with your family because it creates connection, attachment. It gives our kids a soft place to land after a tough day. We can sit next to them. We can create uh, meals with them. I made the joke about, uh, it wasn't really a joke. I do actually have charcuterie platters um, every single, almost every single day for my family. And I sit it on CBC and I felt a little embarrassed by it. But then everyone wrote back saying, I have that too. We just call it a deli platter, things on a plate, smorgasbord, but creating a platter of food for, that fits everyone's needs. I saw that some folks here on the group had some, some disordered eating stuff that was going on with their kids. So creating a platter where everyone feels that there's some, at least something on that platter that makes them feel okay, having them engage in making it, right? There's certain ways that we can bring this into our day. And those create rituals. And by creating rituals, we're creating safety. So that part is really, really important. And I invite you all to check out Deb Dana's work on befriending the nervous system or Stephen Porges work on polyvagal theory when it comes to this. It, there's some really neat stuff. Another one is Gottman's work on the five to one. This one hit home for me at one point when I was talking about, um, our tone and when I read and I, I did I'm a sex therapist and, and I learned this many 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 years ago but we talked about one it takes five positive interactions to cancel one negative interaction so if you think about what our children are experiencing and, and what we're experiencing there's a lot of negative interactions so we are in a major deficit here and a lot of it comes to the tone that we use right? Five, five. So finding our yes tone. Now you might be asking what per se is the yes tone? Well, the yes tone is a prosodic voice. It's a melodic voice. I'm using my yes tone right now. The tone that is inviting, or at least I'm trying my very best for all of you, but it's an inviting tone. It's one that, that says, I feel a little bit safer here. So I'd like to run an exercise with you if you're okay with this. And I'm going to invite you to close your eyes for a moment. And it can be a little bit triggering. So I will do my best and please take care of yourselves. I promise not to do anything too major, but I just want you to pay attention to how your body feels when I say the next couple words. So I'm inviting you to close your eyes, settle in, strong back, soft belly, take a deep breath in and just listen to my word. No. No. Ah, oh, come on, God, stop it. I told you already, I don't want you to do this anymore. No, you know, we're not doing it right now. I don't have time. I have said this 15, it's time to get up. Get, no, get up. Oh, for goodness sake. You know, I told you this, I've told you twice. What? No. And see, here we go. Take a moment. What happened into your body? Could you please write down in the chat, what did that feel like? What happened? Did your heart start racing? Did you feel a little tense? Maybe this is just totally normal. Caroline cringed. Lindsay had a beating heart. Catherine felt tense. Wendy felt tense. I see frustrated, wanted to close my ears. Oh, Madam Yoga, exactly. You wanted to close your ears. This is what our children are hearing every single day. No, six feet apart. Put your masks on. Don't be there. No, you need to be over here. That, don't be touching it. Hey, over there. No, you know what? You can't listen. No, turn off your mic. Turn off your mic. Turn off your mic. No, okay. No, chat. Stop. Right. Okay, ready? Let's do it again. Here we go. Rachel felt frozen. I hear you. Okay, so we're going to take a moment. Ready? Deep breath in. Strong back, soft belly. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I love that idea. Okay, that's so good. You know what, bud? I love that. How about we do that in just a little bit? I know you got an exam. You know what? Why don't we work on it together? Yes. Yes. Oh, I love it. Okay. All right. Yes.
deep breath. How did that one land? What did your body feel like when you heard that? Oh, rosy inside and out. Calm, warm, soothing, light made me smile. Tingly and happy and relaxed. This is the power of tone. And it is so important in how we communicate because I can say no. And I said no, I think two or three times. I'm not sure, Sherston, you can maybe correct me. Sherston calls this the ECE tone. It totally is. Right, Sherston uses it with me every once in a while when I use my therapy voice. It's, it's a really weird balance. But Danielle, you felt listened to. This is what we want you to walk away from is to recognize that we have the power and it is as small as just picking up the tone. And sometimes what I do, and, and just take a moment and just lift the, the cheeks a little bit, smile. We have a nerve that goes, it's our, our facial muscles connect into our heart. And it is, it, it's so powerful because often when we just do this, we go in and we can feel our entire body lighten just with the smile. And so sometimes my kids will say to me, because I'll do this when I walk into the room and I'm feeling a little frustrated and I do this. And my kids know that something's not right, but they know that I'm trying to be in control. It's kind of amusing. And they'll call me out on it and be like, oh, oh, she's got the smile. But they know that I'm trying. And so sometimes that's as good as I get, <laughs> right? So the tone. And then in this last part, I wanna to talk to you about the behavior is always communication. And I wanna bring this one home. What you see is the behavior, what you might be missing is the safety the lack thereof. You might be missing that there's developmental needs, security, sensory, stress, executive functioning delay, right? Fear and need for connection. So once again, when you hear that your child is maybe using their no tone, that is a great cue that something doesn't feel right for them. And I love this slide. And the reason I love this is because the moment I started to realize how it's connected to breath, my brain went, and this is what it looks like. So Laura Markham talks about four ways to release anger in our body or release tension or chemical energy. When we have movement, we have laughter, we have tears, and we have anger. Now I want you to just look at what happens because here, where Sherston and I are teaching you about mindful parenting, it, it involves the breath, right? So when I laugh, <laughs> That was a really fake laugh, I apologize. But like if when I laugh, there's an exhale. When I cry, <laughs> exhale. When I'm moving, <sighs> exhale. And when I'm angry and raging, <sighs> exhale. When I exhale, I press down on the energy flow to my fight or flight center of my body. Your kids, when they are raging out, when they are crying, when they are spinning like tops, they are so genius because they are actually calming their nervous system in the best way that they know how. What it means is that we have the opportunity to shift it and say, hey, I can see your bottle's pretty sticking up right now. You know what? Why don't we just do a couple slow releases? Why don't we go over and we're gonna sing? Why don't we go and we're gonna chant? Why don't we go and we're gonna laugh? Why don't we go and we're gonna run laps? Why don't we go and just tickle until we like feel good? And only if tickling is with consent, I hate being tickled. So that's for me. So if that works for you, game on. My kids like to wrestle. My one, my family every night does steamroller and where my husband rolls on top of them and pushes them down because they love the pressure and that is a release because they giggle. When they giggle, that is a total release of their sensory bottle, right? Of their nervous system. So there we go. That is our laughter, tears, and anger. So here what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk you through our next favorite part. How's everyone doing so far? Can we just check in? Is everyone doing okay? We've had a, a little bit of movement. We've had a little bit of stuff. It's been an hour here. Rosalba's doing okay. We got Rosie's doing great. Okay, Jocelyn. Whew. All right, here we go. We got half an hour to go team. We're doing great. All right. 
shake it up, do what you need to do. If you need to walk, move, remember in mindful parenting, we listen to the body. So if your body's saying, please don't sit, don't sit. Okay. You're watching me. I'm doing all the work with Sherston. You can totally brax and do handstands. Let Sherston and I do the sitting. We got your back. Here we go. So this is our dose of mindful parenting. I love this tool. And Sherston and I, when we came up with it, we, we, I, I do a lot of CBT work, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. And I, I do a lot of mindful parenting work and mindfulness. And I do sensory processing and EMDR. I, I do a lot of stuff as a clinician. And one of the things that I found is we are all playing with that 20%. But the truth is, is the bodies where we hold a lot of the message, right? It's the bodies where we can do the work. So we came up with this idea and there's four parts. And I thought maybe, Sherston, do you mind if we walk us through this? Absolutely. Okay. So here's our dose. Okay, go for it. Background, this is my last name. (laughs) So in our house, we have a rule where if you cook, you don't have to clean. You don't have to clean. And, And everybody knows because none of us really like to cook, but you know, there's six of us in a small house with a big dog. None of us really like to clean either. So last night I cooked and bedtime. Okay, kids, time for bed. You're going downstairs. And I go through, I have to go through the kitchen to go downstairs. I'm gonna go make myself a cup of tea to take down with me. We're gonna read a story, cuddle in bed for our routine, our ritual, forgive me, our ritual. And I go into the kitchen and there's dishes everywhere. The dishwasher's still full. The dishes from dinner are piled up on top of the counter and there's been some dishes washed, but they're kind of scattered all across. I have a very, I live in a 700 square foot house, very small remaining counter spaces covered in pots and pans, including the oven. And I'm, and, and I describe the situation. So I have a couple of options, right? Option one, I explode, lose my mind and rage clean. Option two is I dose it, right? And so I, are we gonna go through? Do you want to do this? Do you want to ask Let's me? Go through. Do? Let's do it together. Yeah, I want to ask you. I'm gonna prompt you, just like we're gonna do it with everyone oh, else here. All right. So, Sherston, what do you notice? I notice that the dishes haven't been done, and not only have the dishes haven't been done, but the dishwasher is still full, and there's like water dripping down the sides of my oven. There's water pulling on the wood butcher block counter where they've put the pans to dry without towels underneath and the compost bin is open with all this food stuck to the top of it because somebody closed it smushed all the strawberries and opened it up that's what I noticed (laughs) that is a lot to notice there's a little judgment that creeped in but we're gonna let you go on that one so how do you feel I was feeling exactly like I looked right there I was feeling really, <laughs> I'm really living the emotions like it's crazy hey I'm really living it because I'm frustrated I'm really frustrated we've been practicing this rule as long as I've been a parent which is coming on 19 years now <laughs> and and I really wanted to just make myself a cup of tea and go downstairs so I'm, I'm feeling frustrated and a bit disappointed Okay. So where in your body do you feel that? I usually get it right in my pelvic floor. That's where it goes. And it goes, um, but it also goes okay. to my neck. So, and, and my, it's, yeah. So I, okay, so what could you do to soften? So what could you do in that moment to soften that sensation in the pelvic floor, the neck and the chest? I took a, I took a deep breath, I took a deep breath. And I saw that there was, one of the dishes was a glass of water that somebody hadn't finished. So I, I drank the glass of water that was on that was on the butcher block next to the big puddle of, of water. I took a big drink. Okay. And now it's time to some exploring. So I'm wondering how could you connect or what phrase would help you shift your thoughts in this one? Well, I have to say what I did next was I actually took it took me eight minutes. It took me eight minutes to go through and I needed to, I, for myself, I couldn't just walk away. So that was my connection with myself was I, I emptied the dishwasher and I, I made some really interesting discoveries because actually some of the dishes had been put away. And what I discovered was that 
my youngest must have been on dishwasher duty because she can't put the heavy, we have these beautiful heavy plates. She couldn't put those in the cupboard because she doesn't want to break them. And the glasses are up really high and there was no stool in the kitchen. So she did what she could. She put over the cutlery and a few of the other Tupperware containers. My son must have been on, well, I knew he was on dish clearing, but he stacked up all the dishes and they were really beautifully artfully stacked. He had totally <laughs> made like little mandalas with all of the dishes that he had stacked. And, yeah. And then my eldest, our second oldest, must have been the dishwasher. She had an exam. There were no dish towels out there in the drawer, but she must have just speed washed the dishes and then spread them out and told her siblings to dry them. But of course they didn't. And then she went to go and study. So this taking those few minutes helped me to kind of process what I wouldn't have seen it otherwise. So it helped me to process that. And then I went downstairs. I went downstairs, I was feeling way better because my kitchen was clean because I couldn't fathom the idea of going downstairs afterwards. And I went into the room and they were both tucked into the beds with their books and they were so excited to read. And so I called in and I didn't talk about it. I, I, uh, I made the choice to, that's a tomorrow discussion. Right now what my child needs is for me to sit there and read and cuddle and love them. Oh, and my phrase was let it be, like, right? Like, just let it, let it be. This is, this is what happened. My kids do well when they can. My kids do well when they can. And they, they did. Iris did the best she could. Hugo, who's really creative, he's done most, most of the art behind me as my son. And my eldest had to go study for it. Right? So, yeah. There are so many wins in that. And Danielle, I think you pointed out my favorite one, which is this is a tomorrow discussion. There's a few in there. Let it be in the tomorrow discussion. When our nervous system is on fire, when we go into that fight or flight, we want immediate response, immediate. So that's why we react. But the more we practice these, these little mindful moments, this breathing in the moment, the, all of this stuff, then when we practice these things, what ends up happening is we get the space and things can become tomorrow discussions where we are level-headed, we feel clear, we feel like we can handle it because your nervous system is calm, my nervous system is calm and now we're open for discussion. We're open for collaboration. Can anyone else tell me what were some of the other wins in that experience? There were so many. Can I see that Jocelyn like let it be, right? Anyone else have some ones that they felt like this was, that was a, a bit of an aha moment. I like the drinking of the water. I drink sparkly water all the time. And it's just like a little party in my mouth and it makes me feel super happy every time. And sometimes I just listen to the sparkles when I'm feeling exhausted because it just, it's like a, it's like fireworks. <laughs> Talk about glimmers, friends. Talk about the glimmers. I buy that Anyone else? firecracker chocolate. Have you ever tried that? Anything. It's chili pepper fire. Like it's got pop rocks in it. Dark chocolate. Those are my firecrackers. <laughs> See? right there that's the little hit of a glimmer so trying to understand from the kids perspective danielle exactly when we're trying to see and we get kind open curious remember mindfulness is choosing to pay attention to this moment right now with kind open curiosity so when we start doing this we want to it gives us space that that learner not judge our mind the moment we shift from not judging, which is a sympathetic, which is a fight or flight response, right? It's a shutdown response into the learner mind, which is that safe and social, that engaged space. We have space. We're using our whole brain. We're using our whole body and brain, all the resources together. That's the magic, right? That's where we're going. So let's walk everyone through this if you're, if you're open for it. So I'd like you to think of a slightly stressful moment with your child. We're talking about a three to six here, folks, right? I don't want any big guns quite yet. You got to dose small doses at the beginning, right? We, we, we ease into the practice. So think of a, a slightly stressful moment with your child. And if you'd like, you can drop that stressful chat in because you know what, as you know, co-regulation works with uh, 
everybody, it might feel helpful to see that other people are experiencing the same thing. So for me, my stressful moment. Um, it's cleaning. It's cleaning up. Oh, Valerie, that's what it is. It's not walking the flipping dog. Yes, I'm with Valerie right there. Repeating things, refusing to sleep. Yes. And Rosie, I love that. And it, my partner at one point said, if we're saying it over and over again, maybe it's not them, it's us and the way we're communicating it. <laughs> I thought, okay, that's, that's a good one. Rushing through supper. Yes, Ethan. Right? So we want to pay attention. And remember, you can drop into chat or you can drop into the Q&A, whichever one feels best for you. Not doing homework. Yes. Right? So pick those stresses. Those are all perfect stresses. And I can relate to every single one of those. I'm not sure if you can too. Sherson, can you relate to all of them? Uh, yes, I surely can. I'd like to add finding individual socks shoved into every oh my gosh in my home <laughs> like, like every all the time all the time into the sofa on the floor and the entryway in the kitchen there was one yeah there's one on the cutting board there was a sock on my cutting board a couple days ago <laughs> just, <laughs> how does that even happen like how does that even happen no I just want to say, Harley, I, I hear that one so big because I'm in session most of my days. My kids not doing exercise during recess is a big trigger because they're not moving. So I'm worried that they're not getting the release that they need through the day. It's something we're collaborating on right now. Let me tell you. Okay, so we all have our thinking of our slightly stressful moment with our child. I'd like you in one word, because now you've got that practice just to describe it. Remember, we're not judging. This isn't my kids leaving socks because they're lazy and they don't know how to do anything. Leave that one out. My kids leaving the socks around. My kids doing Minecraft during remote learning. My kids staying in front of their screens. Okay, there we go. And now I'd like you to take that next one, which is I feel. So I wanna know Claudia, Harley, Obsessed, Rosie, how does it make you feel? How does it make you feel to not have those things be done or to have them be done. So for me, when I see my kids not walking the dog, I feel, I feel so almost betrayed because they convinced me to get a dog. <laughs> Unappreciated, I feel helpless. I put betrayed, I think that's a bit heavy, but it's still there. I see I'm failing, I'm tired, yes. All of these things. I want to know where you feel it in your body. Disrespected, irritable. Where do we feel the stress in our body? Where do we feel the disrespect in our body? The chest, the shoulders. Rosie, where are you feeling that frustration and overwhelm? Right? Head, neck, shoulders, beautiful. <laughs> confused. Sherston, where do you feel the confusion? Right? Notice where you feel in the body. And in this moment, right now, what can you do to soften? Sherston taught you how to do the, the glimmer dance here. I'm sure there's another one, but that's what I'm going to call it. The glimmer tap, right? You can have a glass of water. Soften the sensations. Attend to your own nervous system. Release release it okay so rosie maybe we can do a little smile maybe you can do a little rub maybe you can just like give a little massage take care of yourself so we so soothe that sensation and then when we're all ready and our nervous system is there and we're ready to do the exploring piece i'm going to give you a moment i'd like you to close your eyes and i'd like you to just visualize just like sherston did she stepped out, she saw the, the Mandela, she, she got curious about why Iris hadn't done those dishes. She got curious, right? She engaged that learner mind. So I'm gonna invite you to all stop for a moment, close your eyes and just explore. How could I connect with my child right now? How could I connect with myself right now? 
How could I connect with my family? This is part of that cue storming, right? It's the question, thinking, getting curious. Notice if there's tension as you're, you're asking those questions. If there's tension, your body's not quite ready. We still need to do some softening. So go back to the softening and come back to the question when you're ready. Timothy, our mind likes to wander so well and pick up all the things, but see if we can stay focused on that one stress. Tune into that one sensation or multiple if there are, soften and then explore. How can I connect? Take a deep breath in. And let's talk about what we saw. So Danielle said that I think it takes time, which I think is a really important piece. We're talking about rewiring, right? Many of us have our go-to autopilot responses and that's often anger that's often judging, that's often frustration. Or for many of us in this languishing world, it might be pulling back and saying, I give up, I'm done. All of those are just perfectly normal responses. Your nervous system, your body is telling you something. And so in that moment, we can see how that dose, that describe the own your kid's not making you feel like that. The situation is making you feel like that. It's not personal. The softening, so many of us are so disconnected from our bodies that to ask them to soften is really hard. It's really hard because we're not used to softening. We're used to hardening up. We're used to pulling up our bootstraps. And here this woman's telling me to soften. Like, what the heck is that? You're asking me to lean in with kindness to my kid who's being a total jerk to me? Yes. <laughs> because if we want it to shift, I've yet to see, you know, two amygdalas, two angry nervous systems fighting each other and having them go, well, that worked. I feel a lot better. That's fantastic. You know what? Problem solved. Right? I, I've never seen it. And so in that moment, the practice can start small. It can be the little things. You know, a sock on a cutting board, that's not a big gun for me. I see socks everywhere. Eh, but that's a great opportunity to practice my dose. Describe, I see socks. Own, ah, I feel like it's disrespectful. Soften, <sighs> explore. What is something I could say that could shift my thoughts? It's not personal. It's just a sock. What's my long game here, right? What is it that I want? So those are the things that we're doing in this practice. Did anyone else have any, any takeaways from that? I like Madam Yoga's piece. It allows me to explore the other person's point of view and understand where they came from, absolutely. All right, so here's our part of our workshop. I can't believe, Sherson and I usually spend so much time trying to rush through all this stuff that it, it's amazing that we have 12 minutes left. I'm quite excited because it means we can answer some questions. But I'd really like to know what your takeaway is from the course. And it's a bit of a joke with my clients because I ask this question at the end of every one of my sessions, which is what's your takeaway? What's your next step? So I would like to know what is your takeaway? Of all of those slides, and there were many, we've talked about oxygen mask, we've talked about our balance wheel, we've talked about the yes tone, we've talked about the five to ones, we've talked about understanding behaviors. We talked about doing kids do well when they can and that they're not giving you a hard time, they're having a hard time. We talked about the nervous system and how our body feels, our body 
feels emotions, right? So what I want to hear, all the takeaways that you can get, because that is going to be the gold nugget that will lead us to our next step. So, Sherson, what do we see here? Being more mindful. Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, yes tone. Lots of yes tone finding our tool. Absolutely. Um, taking time to breathe. Taking time to just pause. And that's really hard to begin with. Um, actually trying to remember it. I think that was um, Orange A. Sofer was giving exercises in, in, uh, in his book on communication and saying, you know, learn to pause before replying, learn to incorporate pauses into what you do, because then in those big moments where you need to pause, you know, before you send the email, pause, step back. Before you reply to your child who's just thrown something at you, pause, step back. Those are really important. And it, if you can start with smaller things, that'll help you be prepared for when the big stuff comes up. Chunking stuff, absolutely, that's huge. And then Robin's question again, what happens when we legitimately can't find the time to fill and find the wheel? You wanna go with that one, Beck? Rebecca? Sure. <laughs> She'll get it. <laughs> 44 years, she's been calling me one name. I'm like just telling her to switch it up here. So when we really legitimately can't find the time, I wanna, I like to use the rock, pebble, sand example. There was someone who said, I love calm the chaos. And so, you know, this is one of Dana Abraham's favorite teaching. It's also one of our favorite ones with, with uh, coaching. If we have, imagine your things are the priorities and you have the, the noise and you have the things we have to do. So the sand is the noise and it's like all the, you know, the Facebook, the Instagram, the social media, the sh online shopping, the things that just take time. And then you have the next line, which is like in the bottle. So if I imagine well, I'm filling my bottle and I have, okay, here's my sand. And then here I have the things I have to do. I have to cook for my kids. I got to feed my kids. I got to do my work. I've got to do all this stuff. And at the very top is, is my self-care. It's the priorities that are like uh, sleeping, eating, taking care. Well, they don't always fit in, right? It's hard to fit those in because I've got the noise and I've got the half twos. It's, they don't all fit. But if we flip it around, we put the things that are we have to do first. You know, I got I got to sleep well. My sister is probably the most incredibly balanced individual who practices and walks the talk of self-care more than any other human I know. And she has successfully raised four children that are quite spectacular who make mandelas out of dishes. So here we go. We got the things that we have to do. So it's like I sleep, I do my massage, I do my yoga, I do my stretching, I, I take my breathing. And then I have the things I have to do. Well, then the noise fits in top. And as you know, sand fills in the spaces, right? I think that's one of the things that is really important is that sometimes we have to flip it. We have to step back and get some space so that we can say, how can I think of this differently? Is there another way for me to see this? And then we brainstorm it until we can go, what would have to be true? What would have to be true for me to, to meditate for five minutes a day in the morning? What would have to be true for me to, to um, read my book for 10 minutes? We call this want wishes have tos. It's a great one. When my kids, I have to do a have to, I give my kids their wish. I plan constantly with my kids. We plan it ahead of time so that I make time for my self care. Rosie asked, how do you deal with children that are all different? Sometimes something works for another. Rosie, I would love to say you just need to do one way and make all the kids adapt. I would love to say that. But I'm going to let Shurston respond to this as she has four children. And I will truly say all of them are completely different. Shurston? They really are so completely different. And it's celebrating their differences that's important. For us, one of the things, if, I'm, if we're talking about meals, for example, it was meals, um, the way that we worked it out, especially now my big girls kind of do their thing and, and one's an adult, right? So she's, she's uh, kind of getting out into the world. But we had a menu and everybody got to contribute to the menu. We all built, built it together. And then that way, you know, it, it 
met the needs of everybody that was there. And, and the option was leftovers of peanut butter sandwiches or whatever they wanted to have. That was always another option that was available on the table because you know what? Food was a big trigger as someone who had an eating disorder. I'm not about to say to my kid, you have to eat this. That's not how I roll. And so it was, you know what? Is it illegal, immoral, or life-threatening? And uh, those were, that was, that was our mom's teaching. That's Barbara Colmore. So it's super old school. <laughs> it goes way back. So it's finding solutions and asking our kids, what are some of the things that we can brainstorm together? What are some of the ways that we can meet our needs together? I wonder, asking that question is such a good one. I wonder, and what Rebecca said about what would have to be true, right? So, so those are, those are a lot of the things that I've used with my kids to help us find balance and we can't always please everybody but as long as they know that there's going to be a little bit of balance and justice in the system as it rolls around to their turn <laughs> it seems to work and I really like Ross Green's work that talks about meeting the expectations and it's a mutual expectation yeah, exactly so you have to you know, when we collaborate it has to fit my needs and your needs so yes you want to play Minecraft for seven hours a day well that doesn't that doesn't work for me so let's see if we can come up with a solution. So tell me, what does Minecraft give you? What does it feel like in your body when you're playing Minecraft? It makes me feel calm. Okay, great. So is there something else that makes you feel calm? What makes me feel connected to my friends? Amazing. Is there something else that connects with your friends? So it's in that time when we get into learner that we're able to go, okay, like now I get to collaborate because I got some meat to work with. I got, I got some, some, some things that I can actually deal with. But we can't do that if we're judging. We can't do that if we're not listening. One of our most favorite quotes that we teach all of our clients when we do our mindfulness at work workshops, and Sherson and I teach mindfulness at work, mindful movements, mindful moments, mindful communication, mindful parenting. Like we've, we've got a whole series going now. But one of them we teach is to listen, is to lean in softly with the willingness to be changed by what we hear. To listen is to lean in softly with the willingness to be changed by what we hear. To me, that is magic. Because that is really what we're trying to invite all of us to do, is to lean in, to listen with connection and collaboration, to get kind to yourself and to others, to be open, to not feel like you have to, to be fitting into every little box, but to take the lid off to see the world with these fresh, magical eyes by getting curious. You bring a little of that into your like parenting, got a lot of magic going for you. So that is what we're trying to teach. So my friends, we have three minutes left. I just want to say thank you so much. I also want to invite all of you to take a moment to, to type into the, we have a survey that allows us to have an evaluation and we promise to lean in softly with a willingness to be changed by what we hear. And if you have any comments or suggestions, if you have feedback or you have things that you would really wish you could have learned and we didn't get to cover it, please drop a note. Our emails are there, our websites are there. I wanna say a deep, deep gratitude to Jill, to Afua and to Courtney who helped organize this event for us. We really, really love doing this work. We are extremely excited about teaching our Mindful Kids workshop, which is going to be a lot of play, a lot of sensory release. We are gonna be teaching the bottle, my friends. There's gonna be a lot of shaking and a lot of releasing. And then we're gonna be doing with our teens, we're gonna talk a lot about how, what is happening in our body because that, when we start to understand about how the body works, we start to understand why our actions are the way they are. So thank you everybody. Shurston, you're an amazing co-facilitator and I'm deeply grateful that I get to be your sister but also be able to teach these courses with you. So thank you so much. There yeah. we go, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very, very much. And look at that, we have 28 seconds to go. I'm just gonna read all the comments. I'm gonna like let these glimmers sink in and fill my spirit, like my, my balance wheel a little bit here. So there we go. <laughs> thank you everyone. And again, if you have any questions, I think Jocelyn, you had your question answered, I believe by Courtney. 
And oh, here we go. The session is going to be recorded. And yes, it will be posted on the website as well as I believe the handouts. Courtney, you might want to drop in and, and let me know about that if I said that wrong. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Merci tout le monde. Thank you so much. <laughs>